Excellent. So I will um, open us up real quick in a word of, of prayer. I know that I already used this verse as a prayer for a previous week, but I figured it's just really good to see it again, especially because it's, it's very much pertaining to uh, this week. So please join me in prayer. Lord God, please be with us in this time. May your Holy Spirit guide us in our discussion. May your grace open our hearts to, per to perceive your love for all creatures and for all of your creation. We pray that you would enable us not to only look to our own interests, but to the interests of others. We pray that you would grant us the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not re regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, Lord, you also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that so at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. And we talked about uh, a couple of weeks, like I've, I've mentioned um, verses that are rather um, like inclusive of, of animals or speak of all creation, right? We talked a lot about the Colossians hymn, um, you know, that it talks about like all things being given, you know, it's through him and to him exist all things. Uh, and we kind of do see like another verse there in that Philippians hymn. I was reading from Philippians chapter two, um, you know, all things in heaven on earth and under the earth. That's a very like expansive uh, broader inclusive uh, thing of, of creation. So there's potential there that it has a connection to animal theology as well. In our previous two classes, we examined and talked about and, and critiqued and went through a lot on an ideology called anthropocentrism, or as it's also called, uh, anthropocentrism. I've seen it written both ways. Uh, both are acceptable. Um, but it is an ideology that places humans and human interests at the center of everything. So then everything uh, becomes valued insofar, or only insofar as it relates to human interests. And in theology, we talked about how it has a couple of uh, different implications, and it can end up making like humanity the first and foremost focus of everything that we do and think about within Christianity. It's kind of like we start from the perspective of humanity and then we only end there. And we don't really talk about, uh, you know, the broader scope of God's creation. We also looked at how anthropocentrism can do things like uh, influence us toward reinterpreting scripture or misinterpreting scripture, uh, such as when it comes to interpreting what the image of God means. And then last week, we looked at the philosophy of Rene Descartes and the evolution creation debate and how these were two important instances, uh, or, or we might say influences, that have shaped our perception and imagination of animals in the direction of anthropocentrism. And so today, I thought that we could take on a goal for this session and that we could try to cultivate a way of perceiving and imagining non-human animals in a way that is grounded in Christ. It's like that famous hymn, uh, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. I really enjoy that hymn, but I also, I would hope that we would kind of take that as a prayer tonight. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Because I would want that to be our type of goal for this evening, that uh, this type of perception or imagination, or as the hymn says, vision, uh, that, the, that we would have that type of outlook on the world or imagination of the world that would be 
permeated and sanctified and transformed by God. And so let me clarify first a little bit what I mean by imagination, because I throw that word out there and it, based on its usage, I, I think we probably kind of understand what, what I might mean, but I also just to, for clarification's sake, I don't mean make believe, you know, uh, I, I mean that that sense of how one represents the world to oneself. Uh, that's why I like to link it with the word with the word um, perception, because it asks that kind of question of like, through what lens is one viewing the world? Like whenever we are trying to interpret the world around us, kind of like what, uh, how do we end up representing and, and perceiving things? around us, not just in term, not so, so I don't mean like physical vision, I mean a type of um, interpretive lens through which we see reality. And anthropocentrism is a type of lens that colors the way we perceive the world. Um, it is a type of, I introduced this word, I think two weeks ago, it's a type of cultural liturgy that influences how we imagine the world. Uh, in this, in, in my perspective, because I've uh, been very clear about how I disagree with anthropocentrism, it's kind of like, uh, you know, funhouse mirrors that like you stand in front of it and then like the reflection gets distorted or um, something like that. So it's kind of like having some of those, like, you know, having some of those on your eyes. Um, and, and as Christians, we believe that God has revealed God's self as Lord in Jesus Christ. And so in response to that revelation, we are called to adopt the, the spiritual mind and eyes of Christ, if you will, um, kind of like how I mentioned in the, the prayer beforehand. And there are several, I didn't feel like any of them exactly fit uh, uh, tonight's session, though, um, like the United Methodist Book of Worship, for example, which... I'm a huge fan of. I, I really like this thing. People don't really use it enough. Um, if that's another thing that you can take away from this class, it's uh, it's to read the United Methodist Book of Worship because uh, it has some great stuff in it, uh, and it has like a whole section, a whole uh, kind of mini liturgy on praying to have the mind of Christ, and I just think that's really great um, because I think that's part of what Christians are called to do. Uh, like I said earlier, with that hymn, "Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart." And so Christians, I believe, should have a kind of imagination that is able to perceive the value that non-human animals have because they are so deeply loved by God and because they belong to God. Uh, and I believe that we are called to treat them in a way that corresponds to that future redemption of all things that we talked about whenever we looked at Isaiah chapter 11 and Romans chapter 8 and the hymn in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, that I believe that we ought to be learning how to treat them in a way that brings the future reconciliation and redemption of creation into the present, just like we seek to do in our relationship with, with humans, right? That kind of restored, reconciled sense of love that we can have to God through Christ. We want to extend that and cultivate that with others. And so likewise, I believe that we should be about the business of um, cultivating that to the world around us, to be involved in that ministry of reconciliation and healing, not just to our neighbors, but also to the world around us, to all creation, both uh, kind of the natural environment and animals. Uh, and so anthropocentrism is something that I see as kind of a threat to that. Um, and, and I believe it's something that truncates our imagination, if you will, uh, it, or limits our imagination in which we only maybe seek healing and reconciliation with a with a smaller scope than what our faith might be calling us to. And remember what we talked about last week with um, with Rene Descartes and some of his followers and how I know this might be mean, but just kind of how ridiculous they could be. Uh, and they got to this point where they could not even imagine non-human animals experiencing suffering when it was, uh, when like horrendous animal suffering was happening right in front of them. Um, or 
Uh, I mentioned that example a couple of weeks ago that Andrew Lindsay writes about in his book where um, there was some scientist or, or politician or philosopher who uh, was witnessing this kind of suffering that was happening to animals and they're like, well, it's, it's probably not that big of a deal because animals can't enjoy poetry. <laughs> and it's just, you know, these types of absurd, you know, steps in logic, but it is a result of that kind of truncated or, uh, yeah, a type of truncated imagination. And so I believe that it is of moral and existential importance that we not only as Christians, but as humans move away from anthropocentricism. Because the ideology, the ideology that only human beings matter and that all creation exists uh, just to serve our own interests, it's fueled things like deforestation and environmental devastation, pollution, and all sorts of animal abuse of the worst kind. And I promised that I wouldn't try to depress y'all too much in this class. And so I won't go into detail about any of those issues, uh, but also I'm, I'm sure that we are well aware of the animal suffering that exists throughout the world, whether it's in the Australian wildfires that happened um, a couple of years ago, which uh, was horribly devastating everywhere in the news for a long time. And uh, the, the toll that it took on, on non-human animals was just one of the most horrific things I've ever seen in my life. Um, and we've, and then a global pandemic happens. So um, some of us, uh, our minds have kind of become more preoccupied with that. But if you remember, that was a big issue that was especially prevalent to the, the suffering of non-human animals. And uh, the, it was also a problem that was exacerbated by, according to, to scientists, it was exacerbated by uh, what humans have done to the environment that has accelerated climate change. Um, and likewise, uh, even beyond things that, that humans do to animals, it's also, uh, there's the way that animals suffer and die as a result of predation, kind of the, the um, so the suffering of non-human animals is a big issue that I don't think we can simply ignore. Um, and, I, and I think that it's important for the church to really think critically about these issues and to start developing some more theological resources to approach this topic. Um, and personally, to be honest, it's just, <laughs> it's one of my biggest difficulties for my own faith as well. Um, you know, it, the, everyone's aware of kind of the problem of evil. If God is all loving and all good, then, then why do we <laughs> suffer? Um, and so I, you know, this is one of those areas that's, that's difficult for me as well, whenever you bring non-human animals into the equation. Uh, and I'm not going to solve that problem tonight, unfortunately, um, but I do want to present us with a new way for perceiving non-human animals, um, or at least a type of theological tool that would enable us or maybe inspire us to start thinking about how to minister to non-human animals and how to minister to the non-human parts of creation. Um, so hopefully we would, we'll be able to get the ball rolling on that a little bit. Uh, and this is something that I have called my animal liberation theology, which is based on the biblical theme of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Um, but before we begin, I do want to take a moment to um, stop and ask if we have any uh, questions or, or any clarifications, uh, need of clarifications or, or thoughts or comments or anything like that. I have a question. Um, yes. Feel free to tell me if it's a question that should wait till the end to be answered. The question is, um, now hearing you talk about this again, do, what do you feel like, how do we observe the difference between people that hold to, between Christians that hold your perspective and Christians that don't in a practical sense, like when we observe those people? 
Uh, could you elaborate on your question a little bit? Yeah, kind of like the Christian that holds an anthropocentric view mm -hmm. versus the Christian that doesn't. Um, what do you observe physically, practically, day to day is different between those two people? Like, is it a consumerism pattern or is it like an interactive pattern? Is it a behavioral pattern? What do you see is different between them? That is a great question. Um, yeah, I, I love that question. And I probably, admittedly, off the top of my head, I don't have like a clear cut answer to that because um, I have not spent enough time thinking about those differences. But I think it's 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 a great question. And I do think that there are differences. Um, I'm trying to, yeah, I, I suppose some of it might be maybe more of a consumer pattern. I don't want to reduce everything down to consumerism though. Um, but it, you know, there might be something of a consumer pattern of, um, you know, maybe Christ some Christians who are concerned about the way that animals are treated and, and things like that might be, you know, purchasing and consuming less meat or animal products. Um, so that might be just one you know, kind of immediate difference, whether they're vegan or vegetarian or reducitarian, as it's called, um, you know, that that might be one kind of uh, noticeable pattern of difference. Um, another might be what types of ministries they're open to supporting. Uh, there, there's different, um, there's some like, you know, ministries or charities or, or what have you that are in the business of helping animals, like maybe animals who were formerly abused or, um, you know, certain kinds of sanctuaries and, and so forth. Uh, and so there might be a type of op more openness to helping those types of ministries or, or charities um, that are catering specifically to animals. Um, uh, another one might just be also, you know, more general political concerns uh, as, as well. Um, and so that might influence uh, concerns that they bring to the ballot box, you know, so that that might uh, have some sort of influence on perhaps the way that they vote or the ways if in the, if they're, you know, participating maybe like in, in local politics, maybe some of the concerns that they bring up kind of at at the local level or, or things like that. Um, and that that's just a, a short list. Um, again, that's such a great question that I am you know, I'll keep thinking about that uh, throughout the week. And if I come up with something really great, then then I can email you. Um, and yeah, but I, I, I also, I, I don't know, does anybody else have, have, an, have another answer, anything else that you thought of? Because that, that was a great question. And um, some of y'all might have. Well, it seems to me as though participation in particular organizations or institutions that or supporting the, you know, like the Con Nature Conservancy or uh, Audubon or some of these other things, if that was part of a person's uh, education and understanding, then I think in addition to their theology, you would come at it from another aspect too. So um, it could be behavioral as well and, and community and communal mm -hmm. and other ways of doing it. Yeah, that's a that's a great point now, thank you. Um, yeah. It, it, I think this is what you, if I understand, yeah, what, one thing that jumped in my head also, based, you know, like st trying to stand against like maybe deforestation and, and things like that, trying to preserve more of the natural environment and, and working towards that. I was going to say that question sort of resembles a, a thought experiment I've proposed at various times of if, if somebody came in from another planet, which I guess is assuming another kind of non-human animal life maybe or it could just be somebody who doesn't speak or read our language if, a, if an observer came in and saw us for a whole week what we do what we don't do and you know for the to make it a real question excluding what happens on sunday morning if you're not a seventh day adventist or something can they tell whether or not you're a christian and I guess in to narrow this back down to the the uh, pro 
proposition that Lydia posed, I would say you could also include things like if one is able to afford it, have their their other food sources be organic to the extent that we believe organic farming makes life better for whole animals and sort of crossing into the realm of climate, minimizing our plastic use. And if we, you know, aren't willing to pay more to get stuff that's in a reusable container instead of something that's merely maybe recyclable, uh, at least when we throw something out to leave it in the largest possible pieces, which maybe minimize how many animals end up with microplastics going through their digestive tract, et cetera. So you know, there, there are lots of things that we sort of take for granted in our you know, 1950s, the world is made of plastic culture that uh, <laughs> need, need to be changed if we're gonna fully respect this point of view. Yeah, those are th those are all great. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. These are great, great answers. Excellent. Well, if we don't have any other uh, questions or um, or comments, we'll go ahead and move on now to uh, parsing out a little bit more on on what I mean by uh, non or animal liberation theology. Imagery portraying Jesus as the Lamb of God fills the New Testament. And, you know, there's several places, but some very popular, one of the most popular examples is John the Baptist seeing Jesus and declaring, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And perhaps uh, the most striking verse uh, that portrays Jesus as the Lamb of God is found in the book of Revelation, in which we are asked to encounter Christ, or Christ is portrayed as a slaughtered and innocent lamb. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6 reads, quote, then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, end quote. Uh, and this lamb is symbolic of Christ. And so it struck me that this metaphor, particularly the slaughtered lamb from Revelation, provides a very powerful image for liberation theology. Uh, so liberation theology, if you're not familiar with that term, it is... Uh, um, a type of theological imagination, if you will. It's a type of, uh, it, it's one of the tools that people use to help interpret scripture and to think through different questions about what it means to live a, a Christian life and, and so forth. Um, it uh, has its origins in several different places, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure that you can find uh, plenty earlier examples than this, but one of the people who really kind of coined this term and, and developed it uh, was a uh, theologian from South America. Is it, um, oh man, now this is embarrassing because I'm totally blanking on his name. G Gautier? No. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Um, all right, YouTube people, I'm sure you can comment and, and let me know uh, his name. I'll look it up in a second, because uh, but it's a, theo a theology of liberation. He, he was influenced by the poverty that he was seeing around him in, um, uh, in South America. And there was kind of, he was a, a Catholic priest and there was a failure of, of the church around him to really address these issues of poverty and exploitation. And so then he kind of... Uh, and, and, you know, the people that he's ministering to are, are poor as well. And so he um, starts digging through a lot of the resources within um, the Christian tradition and, uh, you know, is digging through all these verses in scripture and, and is realizing this huge theme about um, God's concern for the poor, God's concern for those who are experiencing um, oppression and exploitation, uh, even just, you know, some of the uh, 
really quick, easy example of the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are you who are poor, or uh, that's the Luke version and then the Matthew version, Bless you, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Uh, so um, that's kind of what got, got the ball rolling on this. And uh, so liberation also has a strong uh, tradition of seeing Christ in images of the oppressed. Uh, based on the verse from, I believe, I think it's Matthew 25, this separation of the sheep and the goats, where, um, you know, the, the uh, Christ is talking about, um, you know, uh, the, talking to the sheep, and they said, you know, oh, Lord, you know, how did, we didn't know that we were, you know, doing these things for you, and he says, oh, whenever you were uh, clothing the, the naked, or whenever you're visiting those who were in prison, um, and so forth, uh, list several of those types of instances, um, you were doing it unto me. Uh, and so I think that's Matthew 25. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, or maybe it's Matthew 22. Um, anyways, uh, parable of the sheep and the goats. You can look at, you can Google it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so it has those kind of, uh, th that theme, right? Of like, you, there, there's this person who is suffering and this person who is, um, hurting, they're in prison, or they are, uh, you know, without basic necessities, and these people are helping them, and Christ says, whenever you did that, you actually did it unto me, so it's a way of, like, recognizing Christ within those people, um, and so uh, it, it's a very, and it's also, like, it, it, how I talked about developing a Christian imagination, right, that's a new way of perceiving the world, right, that's a, that's a way that ought to influence how we imagine and, and perceive like those around us and relate to the world around us. And there have been lots of different um, influential uh, versions of, of seeing Christ in images of the oppressed. One of the most famous comes from the Black American theologian, James Cone. Uh, in his work, I believe it was uh, Black liberation theology, very influential. Um, he just recently passed away, but he, he was one of my favorite uh, theologians. And uh, he famously made the statement that Jesus is Black. Now, to complete, and he, he clarified this a lot. Uh, this was not a statement about the color of Jesus's skin when Jesus was walking around Gal uh, Galilee in the first century. Claire, uh, Cone clarifies that, of course, Jesus was Jewish, um, but what Cone meant by Jesus is black, uh, and he made this uh, for context purposes, uh, Cone made this statement like during the civil rights era, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, under the influence of, you know, Martin Luther King and, and other people as well, um, and so this is coming out of, of these uh, intense civil rights struggles for justice against racism. Um, and so what Cone meant by Jesus is black is that because Jesus so deeply identifies himself with the poor, with the oppressed, with the, those who are being mistreated, and thus identifies himself with the suffering of black Americans living in systemic racism and coming from the violence of slavery, it is a true theological statement to declare that Jesus is black. It's a way of uh, helping people to imagine and to perceive Christ in the face of those who are experiencing that type of uh, racist persecution. And in subsequent years, uh, Cone talked about how this particular black theology can actually be expanded to other oppressed groups as well, or other people who, who are suffering. Um, and he did provide some other examples of this in uh, one of the lectures that he gave about uh, his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. He, he listed a couple examples uh, of it and, and um, talked about, you know, his conversations with people from other cultures who were, who were experiencing similar types of, of persecution. Uh, and so to be clear, I'm not trying to replace Black theology with animal theology, and I'm not trying to equate the two. I'm saying that this is a particular kind of theological imagination, perception, and tradition that is applied to many different oppressed or persecuted groups. And one of those groups, I believe, ought to be non-human animals. 
um, because I believe that this tradition of liberation theology can inform the imagery already found in scripture, that Jesus is the Lamb of God, that Christ chooses to identify with the suffering and exploitation of non-human animals. Uh, with this new perspective on a common phrase, I hope that we can train people and train ourselves to see Christ within the suffering of non-human animals. Uh, and I do have more to, to develop on that thought. This um, I will expand and, and develop that even um, farther. But real quick, did I say if we have, are there any quick questions? Did I say anything that went over anyone's head or just a word that you were, you know, anything that I said that didn't make sense or was unclear? I have a clarifying question. Sure, go for it. So you've mentioned that Christ identifies with the suffering of oppressed people. I see biblical support for that statement. Um, I was wondering, would you give biblical, just like some verses for me to think about on how Christ identifies with the suffering of non-humans? Because I know he identifies with the sin offering of non-humans, but specifically the suffering, I, I'm a blurry on that. Right. Uh, so I identifies with, um, I also mean like kind of enters into, um, it, it, I guess it's just that like kind of that verse that we talked about earlier um, in, in uh, Philippians, you know, he was the form of God, but he did not re regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, being found in human form. He humbled himself, became obedient, even uh, to the point of, uh, came obedient to the point of death, even death on um, the cross. And, you know, that type of entering into the midst of, of humanity, undergoing, um, you know, the suffering and uh, in the life of, of humanity, and then uh, redeeming us. Uh, people have expounded upon that throughout Christian tradition, talking about um, kind of what that means of, of, of Christ, you know, taking on that suffering. And, and, I, and I don't mean it in a sense of, um, I guess it's somewhat related to atonement, but I, you know, I, I'm not trying to characterize it in, well, actually, I'm going to stop my train of thought there because I don't want to get my foot caught in my mouth because I don't know if I agree with. But yeah, I, I suppose it is that general kind of uh, people call it like an incarnational type of love of, you know, God becoming incarnate in our midst. Um, you know, he uh, what's that word? Uh, uh, like first John, you know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um uh, the, the word is, I think, like tabernacled amongst us. Um, so that type of incarnational entering into the human equation, um, the light shone in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. So that sense of joining us within the, the joining human life and then kind of expelling that sense of darkness uh, um, through Christ's own embodiment uh, uh, I'm trying to think like of verses off the top of my head. I think there's something in like first uh, Peter and I, I can't think of it. Um, anyways, uh, I'll keep in mind if somebody else uh, has an answer, feel free to um, drop the, the Bible verse in the, in the chat. Cause I know there is, and I just can't, uh, I didn't do enough, um, you know, Bible trivia in preparation for this. So uh, sorry about that. Um, but no, that's a great question. Um, does the verse about the birds of the air, surely he will clothe you. Does that come close? Uh, okay, yeah. So, so there's this idea, not a sparrow falls without God um, knowing about it. So this kind of uh, deep awareness of, of the suffering, not only of, of humans, but of all creatures. Um, yeah, so that, that could potentially have um, a connection. Okay. I think it's important for me to keep in mind, too, that when Jesus spoke these words about uh, sheep and goats and uh, prisoners and feeding the hungry and the naked, he was addressing the concerns of 
Bronze Age people 2,000 years ago. He didn't get up and say, hey, Willie, you see the internet, that's going to really blow your minds. You know, people then understood sheep and goats. If they didn't kill animals, they wouldn't eat, probably, because the animals fed and clothed them. We were charged by God in the beginning just to be stewards of this wonderful creation. But just because there's no specific mention of that, to me, does not mean that what we understand now as, as human beings who've been given the gifts of science and, and, and more advanced thinking can't incorporate some of these ideas about maintaining the, the, the creation as, as Jesus would, would preach today. That's it. Thank you, and, and uh, thank you for that, Craig. Yes, and uh, also just uh, thank you for mentioning the, the sheep and the goats again. That That is a type of, um, you know, there, uh, you know, we see Christ identifying himself with those people who are in prison, with those people who are um, without clothing and so forth. And so that, that would be a type of explicit identifying with those um, states of, of human suffering or, or so forth. I think too of John 10, I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I call them by name. Okay, okay yeah, so like a, a type of understanding of, of, of the sheep, knowing them thoroughly, um, calling them forth, yeah. Great. Oh, and uh, I see that you posted in the chat. Uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, thank you so much. Uh, gosh, that was <laughs> that was bothering me. Thank you. Yes, uh, that is uh, kind of one of the fa uh, founding fathers of contemporary liberation theology. Um, but yeah, keep thinking of, of Bible verses that pertain to this. Um, keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and I will move on now to this next uh, section. So uh, another point of contact, I think, uh, and it's sometimes related to liberation theology, the traditions are somewhat uh, different given that there's different historical contexts that produce these two forms of, of uh, uh, two traditions. But um, another, I think, connection would be the tradition of what is called subaltern criticism, or it's also known as post-colonial criticism. So it's a type of uh, uh, tradition, philosophy, theology, way of interpreting scripture, all sorts of stuff that is born out of people who grew up in uh, like a world that had been colonized by another country and grew up in, under those type of oppressive uh, systems that colonization brought with it. Uh, and so this is kind of a, a theology and a philosophy, if you will, that's influenced by trying to address those particular issues of, you know, just how the heck do we do ministry in this area? And, uh, you know, what does it mean to, you know, read the word of God um, to these people as we're in these types of circumstances? How might scripture speak to what we are going through um, and so forth? And uh, so I, I believe that in, in a, maybe this is a little bit of a, of a metaphor, but um, I, I do think that there's perhaps some insight to be gained by thinking of non-human animals as constituting a type of subaltern. And the word subaltern, subaltern, term, uh, is a, <laughs> I wrote a tongue twister for myself. The subaltern is a term denoting the members of an oppressed colonized group who have no access to imperial powers that are dominating them. They are, in a sense, often left vulnerable uh, to the mercy or lack thereof of their oppressors. The, uh, the subaltern are quite often stripped of their status as um, creatures or people of moral value, and consequently they experience a type of alienation. Um, and you know you're you're in your hometown, but it's been colonized by this, uh, you're, you know your home country, but it's been colonized by this external force that have, that has radically restructured all the power dynamics, radically restructured the way that you just relate to your neighbors, relate to the world around you. Um, you're having to learn a whole new language now, and so it produces this break within within a self um, and transforms 
the environment in which you live. And so that's a type of alienation. Um, and this alienation can end up placing kind of the subjugated group into um, sometimes uh, a, like an artificially constructed monolith that establishes the uh, or portrays the imperial rulers as superior. That was a lot of needless technical jargon, but uh, as an example, um, remember the process or, or the acts of calling Native Americans savages, right? That's uh, kind of portraying this group of people who have a very rich and complex culture full of brilliant philosophy and art and music and fascinating ways of life, uh, brilliant, brilliant individuals. And yet the colonizers just said, oh, well, they're savages, portraying them as an entire monolith. And, you know, they're savages, we're sophisticated. So therefore that justifies our rule over them. Um, and furthermore, this kind of alienation can end up turning those who are subaltern or those who are subjugated to this rule can turn them into commodities uh, because it seems to exclude them from access to power and, and uh, it just ends up reducing them as, you know, it's a purely utilitarian uh, terms or they are, you know, people can be just transformed into commodities or resources to be used for exploitation, such as in slavery. Uh, one scholar, very famous subaltern critic uh, and philosopher by the name of, and I'm not going to pronounce this right, so I apologize, Gayatri Spivek, probably didn't pronounce that right, Lord have mercy, um, but Spivek uh, talked about, uh, was working out of, you know, examining these types of uh, situations of people who've been conquered and oppressed by colonizers, uh, and Spivak famously asked in this type of situation, can the subaltern speak? And that, was, uh, that was their famous question. So when uh, they were examining the impact of colonialism and how the indigenous and native populations were forced into subjugation under the colonizing rulers, uh, it was that kind of question of, do they have uh, the, the means to, to voice themselves. And the answer, according to Spivak, is no. Um, they are cut off from power. They've been so alienated, they've been so subjugated that, they, uh, that their cries fall on deaf ears, in a sense. Um, you know, we, we might think of like slavery as, as, as a type of illustration. I know it's not perfect for subaltern criticism, but um, or like the way that Native Americans were, were treated of, of these types of, it, it didn't matter what they said to their colonizers, they were so lacking in power, so subjugated and so forth that um, they had no means by which to voice their concerns to, uh, to enter into a type of rational deliberation about how to transform things, um, cut off from power and just you know, lost in that type of oppressed status. Um, and so it's important to recognize that not, not all subaltern groups are the same, um, and it's post-colonial criticism is done for many different groups and, and different historical contexts. But I think that if one looks at the history of what humans have done to the earth, uh, if we look at the current institutions of factory farms, slaughterhouses, and so forth, I think it's correct or at least perhaps useful to say that non-human animals are a type of subaltern where humanity is the colonizer. We, we have radically transformed so many different environments, uh, you know, the impact of deforestation, now climate change, uh, the impact of um, different hunting practices that we've had where people, different human groups have hunted species to extinction or, um, you know, uh, uh, brought one species into a, a foreign environment and then like, you know, completely twisted up that entire ecosystem. And, um, and then, as I mentioned before, slaughterhouses and, and completely changing the way that billions upon billions of animals are raised and lived. Uh, that's a type of colonizing there. Um, and referring to Spivak's question, 
can the subaltern speak? The answer is likewise, no. Uh, Non-human animals don't have the ability to speak in a language that is easily discernible to humans, um, and nor will they ever. Uh, you know, animals can't talk to us. Um, they do cry out uh, in, in a kind of, in, in one sense. Uh, I, I do think animals communicate, of course, but it's kind of like our anthropocentric lens prevents us from being able to listen to them. Um, nonetheless, uh, if Christ, as the slaughtered lamb, identifies with suffering animals, and if Christ is the word of God as taught in John chapter 1, then the subaltern animals have their voice in Christ. So I'll say that again. If Christ is a slaughtered lamb, and Christ is also the word of God, and Christ then identifies with the suffering animals, uh, then these animals have their voice in Christ. And so spirit, theologically speaking, non-human animals are not linguistically deficient, because I believe that Christ himself speaks on their behalf and asks, um, as he did in Acts chapter 9, why do you persecute me? Uh, likewise, in, in ancient Rome, the crucifixion was considered too cruel for Roman citizens. The humiliating and horrendous death was reserved only for the Jewish people, who themselves were a type of subaltern. Uh, likewise, animals who are victims of human abuse, whether slaughterhouses or other means, they experience deaths that are often considered too cruel and agonizing for any human, the death only for a type of alienated subaltern from whom we've stripped all moral worth. However, at uh, the crucifixion, I, I believe that Christ, in a sense, shares in the death of these animals, or at least kind of aligns himself with um, the death of these animals by himself participating in a humiliating and torturous death considered unfit for those who, quote, really matter. Um, and so in a type of, of similar way to James Cone's uh, genius work, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, I think that we could propose a similar type of theological imagination, like the cross and the slaughterhouse, or the cross and the Australian wildfires. Um, and I think, uh, at least my hope would be that we learn to perceive the suffering of non-human animals um, as, or, we, or that we learn to perceive the faith of Christ in the suffering of non-human animals, um, interceding on their behalf and crying out for, uh, for justice. Um, so I'll end my, uh, my thoughts there. Does anybody have any, um, any questions? I just have a comment. Yes. Um, and that is that um, one of the reasons that I decided to devote my ministry really pretty much exclusively to animals and people would say, why would you do that? You know, we, there's so many human concerns out there. We have so many human problems that we have to solve. But one of the reasons I decided to just focus very narrowly on animals is that um, is related to what you're saying. It's um, that I feel like just about every maligned and oppressed human group at some point can speak for themselves. They can get enough power where they can begin to speak up for themselves. But animals never can do that. Mm -hmm. They always will need advocates and that's us. That's um, Christians especially. Because uh, I just feel like Jesus, when he um, died on the cross and became the slaughtered lamb that he negated the need for animal sacrifice of any kind after that. Yeah, I, 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 I would, I would agree with that as well. Um, and, uh, and I, and I like that perspective of, yeah, we do need people who are advocating for, um, you know, for animals and for the proper treatment of the non-human parts of God's creation. Uh, and, and that seems to me a very, you know, important and deeply Christian thing to do. Um, because, uh, and even if one 
was absolutely committed to to the perspective that you should always be choosing to do something for humans rather than something for for animals even if one were entirely committed to that position what we do to animals impacts what happens to humans right i, I mean that's one of the things that we're really learning about from really? uh, a lot of like climate and, and ecosystem mm -hmm. um, type stuff we are we're all in this together right humans are not some sort of separate free-floating thing from from nature what happens to one part of our ecosystem has rippling effects on everything else um and so uh it you know it, it's it, it's not even without i'm not saying that the motivation of helping animals is just to help other humans but even if one were absolutely committed to that um it, the minute it, it does vicariously end up helping um humans as well uh, because you know all of these things are interconnected and so it's important for us to be ministering to all of those um all of those points uh yes Oops. roger or dad <laughs> i'll answer to either um uh, I, I was ironically since i'm probably the only person here that grew up in an actual uh colonized uh country <laughs> nigeria which was uh, which was under the rule of, uh, of England when I was there. I think sometimes when we toss out that word colonialism in reference to it, that I think some of us tend to jump to the literal example of that, you know, from our history books. And, and when you're referring to it more as a, as a philosophical way of, you know, of, of subaltern, I wonder if maybe there are some examples in between there, such as very young human children or, or humans with, with mental uh, deficiencies, that they may not be able to, to communicate in a way that allows them to have their own voice adequately or have the power that they need, or physically disabled people that, you mm -hmm. know, it took it's in decades for them to get their voice to the point ultimately where they were able to get some right. You know, I think sometimes there are some other examples that that begin to bridge the literal colonialism of a country, you know, rulers taking over another country and the animals, which absolutely cannot communicate on their own. And I think that helps me imagine the progression toward imagining the, the animal suffering. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, I'm so, Cause yes, I do believe that this has really important implications for other groups of humans as well, um, like some of the ones that you mentioned, very young children, um, you know, toddlers, infants, and and so forth. People with, uh, like you said, uh, uh, you know, mental uh, disabilities that are not adequately able to, um, like there's plenty of, um, uh, you know, like nonverbal um, autistic people out there who, um, you know, who are, are precious and wonderful, but can't really, you know, speak, but who have, real concerns and, and deserve to be treated with real dignity and, and love. Um, and likewise, I'm thinking of, you know, many people uh, who, who develop Alzheimer's later in life, who are, um, who often lose the ability to, to speak or to express themselves. And yet, you know, they deserve to be treated with, with real dignity and love, but it's kind of, uh, they aren't exactly able to express that for themselves. Um, and yet, uh, but again, I, that type of looking at Jesus as, as the word of God, um, and thinking about these kind of things of, of, um, you know, kind of the, the sheep and the goats parable that we were talking about of, um, you know, as you did unto the least of these, so you did unto me, of, 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 of thinking through those kinds of implications and, and, and thinking of, you know, Christ saying, I, I choose to identify with these people, um, and likewise, Christ is the word of God. And so Christ kind of speaks on, on their behalf and how might Christ be, or to what might Christ be calling us in regards to, uh, those people or to those animals or, um, so forth. It, one could probably do something like this also with, um, you know, with the, more of the, the natural environment of, you know, uh, you know, Christ is, is the vine or some, you know, uh, 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 is, you know, that, that type of uh, imagery might, you could probably do that for that as well. 
I just want to clarify that when I use the word progression, I'm not I'm not envisioning, um, you know, perfect humans with all their rights and then progressing downward <laughs> through these other stages, and eventually we get to animals because, quite frankly, the way I envision it, horrible, you know, cliche from Disney, but is more as a, a circle of life. Yeah, you right. Know, we're all on this circle of life. It's not. I didn't want to imply that. I'm envisioning it as a progression down to animals and we get through uh -huh. these other stages. Right. Thank you. And actually, I really, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I'm definitely going to like put that in the vault and, and, you know, <laughs> use that later because most people know that uh, the circle of life. And I like that analogy of a circle rather than um, like a, you know, a straight line that like, you know, or like a hierarchy, but rather thinking more of like a circle where there's different points on the circle there might be different kinds of spectrums involved there, uh, but nonetheless, all on kind of this interconnected place of life and, and all kind of bearing a sense of, of value and being loved by God. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm hearing the term process theology, liberation theology. These are newer terms to me. Um, and I, the, some verses that come to mind when I'm hearing this discussion of we should be serving the oppressed and probably my mind is operating the way a stereotypical American mind operates um, in every sense. I come from a a Presbyterian conservative background. So that's like the framework my mind has been conditioned toward. So there's a caveat to this question. Sure, that's um, okay. So I'm wondering, like in Second Timothy, we're warned that people will bring teaching that suits their own passions. We're warned in Romans to abhor evil. We are also commanded so many times in the Bible to love. That seems to be the ultimate object, like objective of man, God's purpose. God is love. We are to love others. We are to serve the fallen. We are to serve the people, the widows, the orphans. These things I see rooted in scripture. And I wonder, um, is it possible that in the desire to serve the oppressed, there is the potential to tip into condoning sin. This, so the, the reason I ask this question is, the word oppression to my 21st century mind is connected to things that are controversial in the church, whether that's women or LGBT or animals, um, things that the church does not universally align with um, or disagree with per se. And I wonder if this line of thinking, is there a possibility that it tips into condoning things that we find in scripture are not okay, but are in the modern era viewed as oppressed or, hmm, I don't know if this question kind of makes sense. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for asking. Um, that's so, uh, the, I, and I appreciate you, you, you stating kind of what the imagery of, of the term oppressed kind of brings up in your mind, um, because that gives me the opportunity to clarify. I, um, I, that is not how I mean the term. Um, I, I am thinking about uh, instances in, in which there is kind of a power structure, if you will, or a way that society is set up or the way that a community or a culture is set up that um, exploits or discriminates against particular kinds of people. Um, and, and that I think is a type of oppression. So like racism, I think is a type of um, or like, you know, the Jim Crow laws, that's a classic case of, you know, not allowing Black Americans to enter certain spaces or to hold certain jobs or to move to certain neighborhoods that keeps them down in a particular, uh, or it's an attempt to keep people down a particular um, social status. And that's a type of like 
oppression of, of type of like smushing down, um, if you will. But uh, there's, you know, other uh, people talk about other instances as well. So like if a, uh, this is a, a, a big deal in, um, encourage, uh, there's a, something called like the social gospel music, uh, movement, which uh, might also kind of be like a type of proto liberation theology. Um, but they were really concerned. This is come like early 20th century, um, late 19th century, looking at like industrialization. Uh, and so a bunch of Christian, like a Salvation Army, I believe, came out from this from this movement. Um, and and uh, looking at the ways that like workers were um, being demanded to all of this, like, you know, horrible working hours, horrible working conditions, um, almost no pay. So you, you have your extremely dangerous working environment. People are getting injured all the time. You're not being paid much horrible hours, you know, no. And, and these bosses were like, oh, well, if you don't want a job, then there's a bunch of homeless people outside that I'll hire. And um, so it's kind of like, you know, work this horrible job or end up on the streets. And, and that's a type of, um, you know, oppression to those people um, and so forth. So I, I'm, I'm thinking about it more in terms of those kinds of uh, power dynamics. Um, but I, I do think that um, it is important kind of to your, uh, so uh, I'm influenced, there's a book, I have not read it since I think early college um, and I don't exactly agree with all of it, but he's one of my favorite thinkers. His name, I'll type him in the chat, um, Jacques Ellul. And uh, he wrote a book called Jesus and Marx, um, which is a really interesting look at Christianity and ideology. Uh, and I, I do think that he provided a good, uh, important caution, because uh, like, I don't agree with everything that he says, but I, I do think that it's like an important kind of thing to keep in your mind. If he talks about the important caution of not elevating anyone above Christ, of always keeping, you know, Christ, God above all else, and making sure that that stays as your primary um, love, uh, you know, type of, I, maybe I mentioned this before in, in, in this class, um, or maybe it was somewhere else, but like Augustine, um, he had that famous, uh, thing talking about sin as being misordered loves or, or like improperly aligned loves. Um, so, you know, it's not wrong for me to, um, I'm trying to think of like, uh, what's a decent example? Playing basketball. It's not wrong for me to love playing basketball, um, but it would be wrong if I like dedicated all of my time to playing basketball and then was neglecting to, uh, neglecting my friends or neglecting my family or neglecting, you know, all of my life is just playing basketball. That's the only thing I do. Um, you know, I stopped going to church. I stopped seeing friends and family and I just am out on the court 24 seven. Um, you know, that would be like a misordered love. Uh, and so he believed, you know, God has to be the, the first and foremost love and everything we do ought to be motivated out of that um, love for God. And what I appreciate about what Jacques Ellul says in that book is um, it provides a decent way of cautioning us against, as um, uh, Russell Moore recently said, uh, turning Christianity into just a means to an end. Mm -hmm. um, because that's always like a type. And, and I think that's just something that everyone needs to keep in mind, um, regardless of where one is on the political spectrum. That is one of the biggest temptations that we fall into right now is trying to use Christianity as a means to some sort of, you know, political or cultural end, whether that's, you know, nationalism or, you know, something else. Uh, and that's often where a lot of our problems fall into. Um, and so it's important to kind of keep Christ at the head of everything, keep one's love for God uh, at the head of everything in order to make sure that, you know, Christ is always the means and the end uh, <laughs> and so forth. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so there, there is, I guess, theoretically the, uh, the, the threat of maybe turning the oppressed into a type of idea idolatry um 
or 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 something like that. But I, I also don't want to I say that with caution because I also don't want to mean like helping the poor is idolatry. Forget about it. Because <laughs> um, I, I don't think that's true. But I, I do think it's just important for us to remember, you know, don't turn Christianity as a means in in as a means toward an end, but be working from uh yeah, out of a love for Christ. But but we do see that, you know, within that Christianity does call as, as all the things that you were just mentioning, you know, helping your neighbors, taking care of the poor and the needy, um, um, helping widows and orphans and and so forth. And as I've said in, in a lot of this class, I, I believe that applies to creation and animals as well. Thank you. Welcome. Well, I'm sorry that I uh, that I ran us over um, in time. Um, I'm happy to stay uh, if you have more questions, but I also want to be respectful of, of your time. And um, if you'd like to, to leave, you are absolutely welcome to. I, I want to say um, uh, thank you so much for being in this class with me. It's been such a joy to be able to, uh, to teach you, to learn from you, to talk to you, to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, this is just a wonderful gift to me. So thank you so much for allowing me to have the opportunity uh, to be here with you. It's, it's really just been a joy. Well, thank you for offering it. It's been a, been a wonderful program and I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. Nathaniel. Yes. How um, <clears throat> animal theology to my, to my knowledge is not something that is taught in the divinity school uh unless maybe it's obliquely um i think this is an important important thing that we need to pursue and that's why i said a few sessions back that one of the things that's important to me is how this whole idea of animal theology could be instrumentalized and it seems to me, since it is a theological question, um, that the divinity school would be kind of interested in that. What what's going on in DDS that is related or gives you some kind of hope that maybe it's going to be a topic? Right. Um, well, I will say just in general, and this is not specific to uh, to Duke Divinity, but just in general, as I've talked about this as I've even just mentioned the topic, I'll say, oh yeah, I'm doing a class right now with the church on animal theology, or yeah, one of my passions is, is animal theology. People are like animal, the like, well, I've actually had people like demand me, to, not demand, that's, that's a pejorative, but like demand me to give them an impromptu lecture on um, animal theology while I'm trying to like, you know, eat my salad or something like that. Uh, you know, so, so the, the, there's a deep hunger out there for, for this subject. So I, I just see that in general as a sign of hope, as people really want to know more about this topic, or they have a passion for it, and they are craving um, uh, the tools, theological tools with which to interact with the topic. So I just say that as a general point of hope. Second, um, there are uh, um, there are professors who are talking about this more and more within um, within the divinity school. So Luke Bretherton, uh, in his animal ethics, or sorry, uh, in his Christian ethics class has a section dedicated uh, like a week or two dedicated to, uh, um, ethics concerning creation in which a lot of these questions are brought up. Um, and he's, he's a fast, he, he's a great thinker. Those, uh, Two weeks. I had his course. Those two weeks were just awesome. Um, really produced. Uh, and and I know that sounds like just a little bit of like only two weeks in one course, but two weeks with a brother Tim is phenomenal uh, in terms of uh, in terms of providing um, more education. So uh, that was great. He also um, uh, like a couple of the books that I've read were uh, part of an assignment that he gave. Um, and so I, I wrote um, my term paper about uh, animal uh, Christian animal ethics based on uh, one of the options for for writing in his class. 
Um, so I, I, he is uh, bringing that up. Um, and uh, I believe Norman Wiersba talks about uh, creation theology quite a bit. I've not had a class with him though. So that is not something that I uh, um, am aware of enough though. I did make a friend in one of my class, like she and I became friends because we both discovered that we don't like Descartes. Um, so, <laughs> it was like an online Zoom class. Like imagine us like, you know, chatting with Jen. Oh, you don't like Descartes, me neither. Let's be friends. Um, <laughs> and, and so, uh, uh, so and, and she was telling me she, she learned it from, from Weirspa. And, and so um, some of that work is being done. I, I wish I knew more, it, it'd be, I, there's a lot of really great work being done in um, like uh, they're trying to beef up right now their um, uh, oh I forget what it's called but there's like I think a whole certificate on like food and theology um, and and things of that question which has a lot to do with uh, with animals ecosystem food short deforestation etc um how how animals are treated so but i uh i'm in a different track than that so i, I don't exactly see um other i'm in the theology and the arts department so we're normally talking about paintings uh, <laughs> and things of that nature um though um so yeah i i know that other departments exist and i have heard these these sorts of questions being brought up within those departments, but I'm not like in them enough to be able to provide more of a concrete answer. Other than I, I do know for a fact, Brotherton talks about it. Uh, but I, I agree Daniel, that it's something that needs to be expanded upon more. Um, and uh, though I do see it leaning in that direction, if that makes sense, I, I don't see us going in the opposite direction. So I, I see that as good. <laughs> Thana, that's such good news to hear that over that 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 they're open to that kind of uh, class and that kind of thinking now. Because when I was there thirty years ago, it was completely, totally the opposite. Um, I think Christianity has been so focused on humans, so anthropocentric, if you will, for so many centuries that it's really hard for people that grew up that way to to think about changing or expanding their circle of compassion, if you will, or expanding their, their, um, their thinking. And so it's really nice to know that over there at the Div School, people are starting to be open to this. It's great. Yes, I, I think so. Um, so I, I, I totally agree. It's, um, it's exciting to see, and it is maybe a little bit slower of a change than uh, some of us might ideally hope for, and maybe we wish that, you know, there, there's a required course in animal theology, uh, and everyone had to read all, you know, all of Andrew Lewis's books, <laughs> and of everything, books. Yeah. everything that David Clough ever wrote, and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, you have to have a, a icon of St. Francis in your house, and, you know, <laughs> all that kind of stuff, uh, perhaps we'd hope for, but um, uh, we're not exactly there yet, but I, I do think that we are. But it's moving in the right direction. Moving in a good direction, yes. Because I, I, as I said before, I think that the biblical evidence is there, um, or at least the what the Bible, how the Bible sees animals, is so different than how we've seen animals. That I think if people are just kind of reading scripture enough, um that it, it, it just ends up challenging us. Um, and it's kind of something that can't exactly stay silent for long. Um, and, and, you know, animal ministry does not negate human ministry either. No, I mean, no. think, I mean, think about who's working in slaughterhouses. Those people are the poorest of the poor. And yes, the only yes. reason they work there is because they're desperate, but those are, you know, probably 90% of, all slaughterhouse workers and factory farm workers are those kind of people. Right. It is not the people only who people are... who will take those jobs because they're such horrible jobs. Right. Exactly. Yes. Uh, yes it is not. Um, it's not just. Psycho it's not crazy psychopaths who join that it job. It all overlaps. Me. It all overlaps. 
you know. Yeah, exactly. It, the, oh, the BBC perfect. released a really fascinating article that was just um, talking about uh, slaughterhouse workers and um, people having complete nervous breakdowns on the job is just routine. Um, because it's so, oh. the working conditions are so horrific. Um, and uh, so, you know, one thing is just, even if one does not care about animals in the slightest, uh, something has to be done. That, that's, I mean, even if one only cares about humans, that's no way for humans to be living. Um, well, that kind of work is just soul killing. Oh, yeah. It really is. And so, you know, of course, it just stands to reason. So listen, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to Okay, Talk. great. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Well, listen, I hate this is the last class, but thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. The last class of this session. Of this there session. We go. Oh, yes. Maybe we can okay. revisit this. Yes, okay. maybe. I, yeah, the, so. I, I would. Yeah.